What I'd like for you guys to have a chance to do is, you should have a copy of the bill, probably. I'm not sure if we actually passed it, that's bill copies in. in the folder. Bill copies in your folder. There are also bill summaries that I believe have been passed out. Um, and I want to I want to try to run through um, some of the bill and allow you guys to have some uh, ask some questions of, of me and uh, staff. <clears throat> First, I want to just follow up on the conversation, which I think is helpful. And one of the things when I've talked to uh, DPI or, or superintendents, principals, or other folks is um, I, I don't view a pilot program like this as some kind of either or. Um, as, as we've already seen in our discussion, I think there, there's a sort of a both and that I expect to see happening. You know, when you see good work, you want to you want to see it continue. Um, but we also know that there's a dynam dynam dynamism created from doing different things and seeing how different type pilots are working and what um, you know, Representative Cotham raised some questions about what kind of leadership transitions are happening in a school. Um, and sometimes if you bring in a KIPP school, for example, and you have a full leadership transition, that makes a quicker, more substantial change than another model. And, and again, when you view these as both and, I think we want to get uh, the, the goal of this bill, from my perspective, is to continue to pilot um, the ways that we can get kids who are not performing where we want them to be uh, to, to performing uh, in, in um, grade level and, and above as quickly as possible to Representative Haynes' point, which for all of us I know is not quickly enough. Um, and, and I think you guys, have, as always, have raised a lot of good questions. I think that also relate to our schools of education and how we're preparing our principals and we're obviously doing some new work uh, on that and, and um, I'll be interested to sort of continue these conversations as they spread out. I want to try to give a 30,000 foot description of the bill. The bill is, is long and there are a lot of, even in, when you have a summary of a bill that's still, how many pages are some? Six, six pages front and back. Um, three pages front and back. Three, three pages front and back. Um, you've got, you know, a long summary. So <laughs> I want to try to give you a 30,000 foot description really briefly and then start to walk through the summary with you hopefully having the bill uh, in hand. Um, you know, basically this pilot program would go through a process where a superintendent would be hired by the state board with, with a committee. Five schools would be picked. Only there, there, the requirement would only be that two schools get picked by year two. Now the way we are in our timing right now, uh, if we were to pass a bill like this during the short session, the superintendent would be hired. There would be there would be no schools for the year 16-17, right? 17-18 um, would be the first possible year. And actually, the way the bill is, there would be no requirement to have any schools in until the 18-19 school year, and then you'd have to have all five in by the. 1920 school year. So, uh, frankly, uh, Representative Haynes, from my perspective, probably not quickly enough, but but still a process. Part of the reason for that process is to give that superintendent a first year of really taking a broad look at the schools and then working with uh, the communities um, and the districts. So that, that that's been an important feature. We want the ability for that super to work with the communities with the various districts to try to create as collaborative an effort as possible. Uh, one of the things you'll also see in the bill, we, we provided another sort of pilot within this pilot, which allows for a principal turnaround model, which is not one of the existing four models. It was something brought to us, um, I think by the superintendent's group, I, I met with a number of different groups, and just by the way, for those that aren't aware, I think, uh, uh, Harris had to work through about 40-some drafts with me where we are right now. Um, 
but we should probably have 40 more before we get finished. But um, uh, in that regard, there's a new sort of pilot within the pilot to allow for a principal turnaround that can be exercised by the LEA. So again, talking about this leadership tr transition. Um, and we've also built in time in part so that as a superintendent as selected, if they see issues and work with communities, that they might, we might we would still have opportunity to actually tweak the bill again if there are things that they're realizing and working that need to be done. Um, and so, um, you know, with that, let me try to walk through some of the particulars and then um, let you guys um, ask some follow-up questions. If you're looking at the uh, draft legislation or the summary overview, um, again, it basically would establish an achievement school district uh, headed by a superintendent. That superintendent would be uh, selected by the state board. There would be an advisory committee set up, headed by the lieutenant governor, with a final appointment uh, by the state board. Um, there would be up to five elementary schools selected for the Achievement School District. Just elementary. Um, and, and right now, it, it states that no more than one school could be selected from each LE each LEA, I can't remember if we have this provided or I may broaden it slightly to say unless the LEA itself is okay with that. So no more than one unless the LEA uh, approves it. Um, the selection criteria uh, for this ASD would be um, the school has to be in the lowest 5% um, uh, of all schools unless one of the following uh, applies and so basically if the school exceeded growth in one of the prior three school years and met growth so it has to exceed it and or met or and met in at least one of the prior three years so basically if a school is on an upward trajectory where they've been showing improvement maybe they've got new principal they're doing new things that are showing improvement they would not be subject to the uh, to selection <coughs> or if they're already in um, one of the turnaround models that is existing in statute um, uh, as already provided that, that Kara discussed. Or if the school is in the bottom 10% and uh, the local LEA has asked for it to be considered. So you could be bottom 10 if the local LEA is asked and we could even we could have a discussion about um, broadening that. Um, in that selection process, the superintendent has to go through a, uh, a process of, um, and there's a, I can't remember which section it's actually in here. They have to go through a fairly rigorous process of meeting with local officials, holding public hearings, um, and evaluating the schools, and then making recommendations by a particular time, and then selecting the schools by a particular time. Then, once they're selected, the, the, the there, there's uh, we, we go back to the local LEA and um, the local LEA then has to adopt a resolution doing one of three things they can either accept the selection they could close the school um, or they could um, request the adoption of a principal turnaround model which again is this new model we put in where they could actually um, put a new principal in, and, and there are some particulars about the principal turnaround model we can get into. Basically, I think I initially provided that we'd provide about $75,000 for that method, that the district would have to raise an additional $75,000 uh, in their own district, and then they could pay the principal some more money and have some other funds that they could utilize. Um, that principal turnaround mo model would also be granted charter-like flexibility for the removal of staff and other things by that principle. Um, there'd be public notification of the schools that meet the qualifying criteria. Um, obviously that would, 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 would change uh, as test scores come out annually. Um, and of course these schools would have um, regular, regular uh, they would basically have charter-like flexibilities to, to make decisions. Um, on their regulations, policies, and procedures to, um, uh, 
uh, just having to meet sort of statutory requirements that charter schools otherwise meet. Um, after school selected, an operator is selected to um, come in to um, run the school. We try to put some parameters on the type of operators that come in because that's been one of the big questions. We all know that not all, um, not all operators that run schools are created equal. We got some incredible charters out there, the some that haven't done as well. And uh, so one of the things I tried to do in putting some guardrails on for us in this process, especially as small as we're starting, is to uh, basically we have two criteria uh, that the operator has to meet one of these two criteria. And the first is they actually um, have to have a record um, in, uh, in, in our state or other states, so they can be anywhere in the country, of um, improving performance of either persistently low-performing schools or a substantial number of persistently low-performing students attending the school. So they basically have to have a proven record in in, in sort of turning around low performing schools or helping turn around low performing students. Or they have to be, uh, they have to have a credible plan, um, already be in, operating in our state basically successful charter schools. Um, I think the, the way we worked out our definition was they have to be um, operating schools that create a sound basic education or demonstrate a consistent and substantial growth um, towards the same in the prior three school years. So. Those are your sort of guardrails for the type operator that could be selected. Uh, those operators will be given the chance to hold public information, set, uh, information sessions and outreach to the communities, um, uh, schools and local school board prior to the adoption of the resolution by the LEA. Uh, the next section deals with the management um, of them. Uh, they would enter into a five-year contract uh, with uh, the uh, with the uh, uh, achievement with the achievements with, with the LEA, I mean with the uh, the interaction contract with the ASD contracts with the with the achievement school district. So the superintendent would enter into a contract effectively with the operator. Um, they would have the same attendance zone, basically, as the existing school. So they would come in to the existing school that they are that they're coming into to be the to be in the district. So they would come into that school, have the same enrollment. Um, obviously, some districts we provided if a local school board student reassignment due to population changes or openings or closings of other schools impact the achievement school, um, the AS operator could appeal to the superintendent if they think there's something that is sort of negatively impacting. We want it to be basically the same school zone that it was in previously. We obviously understand districts may have to make some changes, so we want to allow for uh, some flexibility but some protection for the uh, achievement school to, to, to be uh, what we sort of designed it to be. Um, the, uh, the LEA would still maintain the facility just like they do for, for regular schools. And basically the uh, new achievement school would um, uh, otherwise. Um, they've got a couple funding mechanisms, mechanisms which we can, which we can, which we will get into, and I may leave part of it open to, to you guys asking some questions without getting in the weeds on on, on some of the funding. But basically, they're going to come in. They're going to get to use the facility. The school district will still control the facility. They enter into an occupancy agreement with them. Um, transportation would still be done by the local LEA. And, and all these things are subject to, uh, if, if that operator says, hey, we want to have a longer, let's say a KIPP school, for example, that have, may have a longer school day, uh, they may not want to use the transportation of the local LEA because of the way they want their flexibility for the daily schedule. And if that's the case, they would just receive um, transportation dollars in the same manner that a charter normally would. So they would no longer, they wouldn't, the school wouldn't, the LEA wouldn't provide the transportation in that event, but that school would get transportation dollars in the same fashion that a charter normally would. Um, so again, they, they can stay on the same transportation system, stay in the school, and, and really then 
and, and, and run that way, or they can enter into a memorandum of understanding to deal with their transportation needs um, or, or certain other needs that they feel like they've got to do differently than the prior school may have done. Um, uh, with respect to the employees, they're obviously going to effectively operate like a, a charter normally would, um, and that they would uh, hire the principal and select staff members. Uh, there is a requirement that they interview existing staff members at the school uh, and review student data for those staff members. Um, they also have some other allowances for reviewing uh, personnel files and other things that um, may be relevant in their hiring decision. Um, um, and, and, and after that point, they would be employees of the Achievement School District um, and uh, otherwise subject to the terms um, uh, selected by the operator. Um, just to follow up on that point, um, it, the way this would work is a transfer of a school to the ASD would, would be a reorganization of the LEA resulting in a reduction in four. So um, the, after that point, the local board of education could continue, and if the teacher is not rehired, they could continue their employment, they could dismiss them due to reduction in force, uh, or dismiss the employee on other grounds. Um, uh, again, these are some of the some of the details um, on liability insurance, student nutrition and program, uh, student nutrition program uh, that would continue. Um, on with respect to the funding, um, there is going to be there. There would basically you can read the designated funding. Uh, there's two basic mechanisms, I think, and I may um, ask Kara to. Um, help in, in outlining this. Um, I want to try to give you the, uh, the layperson version of, of the funding. I think the layperson version is um, you can either uh, take typical charter funding um, or you can get the funding that would have otherwise gone to that school by the district. Based on an MOU. Based on an MOU, you work at the details. But if the school would sort of say, just to make an easy example, if a school had 10 districts and spent, you know, $50 million uh, on their 10 schools, so $5 million was what was allocated to that school, that it would kind of get that same pot of money. That, that's one option, or it can go and get its charter-like funding. Um, and any disputes resolved regarding all that basically can be appealed by either party to the state board to, to resolve it. Um, and and, and the, I think the for certain schools, some of them I imagine, like a kit for example, some, some schools that are used to operate the charter in some of these scenarios, they may just take their charter dollars and, like they normally would and, and exercise on that. Others that have particular reasons they want to enter into a memorandum, memorandum of understanding uh, may do that. Um, Uh, let's drop down to the supervision of the achievement school. Um, so they enter into a five-year contract. Um, that, that contract could be extended or, or terminated based on how things are going. Um, I think, again, the short version is um, uh, after uh, three years, and Kara, just correct me if I'm, if I'm uh, wrong, and since after three years, uh, if the school has not um, shown certain growth, the superintendent can terminate the contract. Um, and then after, or, or toward the end of the five years, if the school is showing growth and doing well, the superintendent can extend the contract for three years. Now let me be clear at the end of this, this, this pilot is truly a pilot in that it effect, effectively ends without legislative action. The longest any school could go under, under under this as an achievement school school effectively would be eight years if the superintendent if the school is doing well the superintendent was uh, was allowed to extend the contract otherwise without legislative action everything eventually ends um, there's also some termination uh, grounds for the uh, I mean obviously the, the the operator went into a contract. If they violate that contract, the contract can be terminated. There's also express termination 
allowed for financial mismanagement, noncompliance with federal state laws, um, or evidence of criminal activity. So there's some other um, other uh, uh, express ways to turn it. Uh, the principal turnaround model, which I already um, highlighted, um, would uh, put a turnaround principal on a five-year contract. Um, And basically, the ASD would stay in regular touch, even for a school that's that's going that route. I mean, part of what I would hope the superintendent would be doing is, is looking at our other turnaround models. And the, the goal in all of these should be to learn from each other and continue to make sure we're getting the best results for our students as possible. Um, lastly, I think, sort of for our purposes, before I can open it up to questions and discussion, um, is there's, there's a desire to put an independent evaluation in, and um, I'd actually like to move that to the front end, and I'll have some um, further discussion just to make sure we're, we're getting, I know Representative Blackwell's a big fan, making sure we get good data on an evaluation of what we're doing, and, and trying to make sure we provide for that uh, in this case as well. Um, so with that, trying to shorten a very long bill, um, let me open it up for, for questions for me or staff. Representative Blackwell. Thank you. Uh, two, uh, I hope, constructive comments. The first is sort of following up on uh, much of the theme of Representative Haynes' question and comments. In the section of the bill that talks about uh, the uh, achievement of school district needing to exceed the average annual percentage growth of other qualified schools. Other qualified schools, I understand, are the bottom 10 or 5 percent, uh, the lowest performing schools in the state. Being above the average of those schools will never get you to proficiency. I think the standard that y'all look at making the standard, we're looking for something that's going to actually close the achievement gap. We don't, we're looking for something that's going to get the kids to proficiency within a short period of time, all due respect to Dr. Barber. Uh, so I, I would take a look at that. And, and secondly, uh, you uh, pushed my button uh, on the down of these. Uh, uh, Representative Rydell and I uh, sponsored in this past session in the House wisely uh, passed it, I think, uh, unanimously, a bill that would set up a procedure for uh, evaluating and creating the data using an independent assessor as to whether something was working. And you, you sort of got provision for it, but the thing that concerns me about the language here is it seems to suggest that the state board contracts with that independent assessor to come in at the end and look back. But if you don't contract at the beginning, you may not have the data collected in a meaningful way. The, the assessor may say, well, I really can't tell you well because you didn't do this or you didn't do that. So I would simply encourage us to make clear if, as this goes forward that that ought to be from the outset, and that can also help us if this is in place. Uh, you can look at your data going forward instead of waiting five years and saying this didn't work, you may be able to tweak or adjust. Uh, thanks, Representative Blackwell. I will just follow up and say I, I agree with you on that point. I think when we originally drafted it, you see those studies cost <clears throat> some money and being, being fee sensitive. I may not have drafted it that way the first time. Uh, although I think some, some folks may want to study, they may they may grant or, or otherwise agree to study it otherwise. So I, I, I agree with your comments. Who else? Uh, Representative. Just a general housekeeping question. Yeah. Um, so that we'll determine if I have more questions or comments. Is it your intent to have additional meetings of this committee? Where we're in? Can you kind of tell us if yeah. that's true? Who we're going to hear from? <coughs> that might involve some of us. Thank you. And I'm sorry. And uh, like, like I know many of you um, have been trying to practice my day job and, and uh, even though I've had conversations about this, I realize we may not have sent everything out to you guys. I, I wasn't sure if we had or not, so I appreciate you asking, Bob. There'll be two additional meetings, uh, one in February and one in March. I'll make sure that Kevin um, gets that information out. Um, <clears throat> at the one in February, we'll plan to hear from some actual folks 
in, uh, I think, from maybe Louisiana and Tennessee that have been actually, you know, working in um, turnaround situations. And we'll be able to have some more, to, and we'll also have some public comment probably at the next meeting and be able to have some further discussion about bill details. Um, and then at the last meeting, we'll have, uh, we'll make a, a recommendation, have some further discussion and make a recommendation. Uh, Representative Marsh. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This is a question for staff, if you don't mind. Um, so it looks like the ASD would select the charter, excuse me, not a charter, but a school operator, um, and it's a five-year contract. Does that selection have to be approved, or is that completely up to the superintendent? The ASD it, it does have to be approved. Yeah. If you look on page three of the bill, like, Again, they have to meet those criteria that we've outlined for those guardrails I mentioned. It has to be meet, meet one of those two criteria to be eligible for right. first selection. And then one last very brief um, question, uh, again for staff. So it looks like um, the lieutenant governor would, would lead a selection process or recommendation um, for the ASD superintendent. That's right. um, but it looks like, um, again, the Board of Education would make the final decision on who to hire. That's great. But um, was there any thought, maybe uh, uh, Representative Brown and Mr. Chair, this is for you, would, would it, is there just one person brought forth the recommendation? Um, or maybe could the Lieutenant Governor's selection process, a recommendation process, include more than one person for the board to consider? And it looks like the board can hire whoever they want to. So there could be one person recommended, but the state board can hire anybody. But I was just wondering if maybe we could include language here, uh, maybe it's something for us to think about, that the, the selection process, maybe they have to bring forth three or four or five names to consider. Um, you know, it's that way the Board of Education would have more than just one person to consider, I, you know. I, I think to your, to your point, that's right, they ultimately have determination, and I would imagine they'll go through the process. I'm not necessarily against the process where they have to bring forth more folks to the board um, sometimes like we've seen in other situations there's a little bit of concern about how broad you uh, if, if representative Cotham is suddenly interested in the position how, how broad you go in an announcing someone's interest in a position so I think sometimes we try to limit it just to prevent um, I mean ultimately the, ultimately the board's got to make the selection but sometimes I think we, we do limit it just for, for not exposing someone who might be interested to more folks. <laughs> <laughs> you may have some time coming up. I don't know. <laughs> Representative Horton. First of all, uh, I think to really commend you for the whole, I know you've been working on this a long time, and you've been through an ungodly number of iterations and more to come, I'm sure. But to focus on this challenge, something that long overdue for the legislature. Certainly in light of, of comments by Representative Haynes, um, frustration that we're not going fast, we're not doing enough and we're not doing quickly enough. But I think there's also some mechanical issues that I'd like to get addressed and doesn't, certainly not now, but my staff, in the, most, in the funding area in particular, I'm concerned about how this lays up against local activity, local funding measures, uh, in various LEAs, all, all of which are, are different. And some LEAs uh, get more local support than others, and some LEAs have different rules and regulations and, and processes. Uh, so I'm, I'd be very interested to know how all that's going to work. Uh, I tried to get through the bill last night. I didn't make it before I went into Z-Land, but uh, let me, let me say, I will say that, that it's, a, it's a great question. It is very complicated, obviously. I mean, and again, I will say, if, if a school so elects to just sort of go under the, under a, what I'll call a normal charter method, it's not that, it's not as difficult and that it would be handled just like 
it normally would if you were a charter opening. Um, if, in terms of the dollars you go, know, if not, it is um, a more complicated process. But, but the goal is to make sure, in that case, in what I'll call the more complicated process, that the LEA wouldn't be putting any more money toward the school than it otherwise would have been putting towards it previously. So again, if you had 10 schools and you're spending, and it's not obviously how it works, but if you're spending X dollars per school from a local perspective, you would just, the normal amount you would have spent, that's what would go to that school. So right, that's, that's, that is the very, very layperson version of what we have tried to do. Certainly, as you said, it's, it's very complicated when you really get into the details of how the money works, who's responsible for what, and who owns what, who's responsible for repairs, you talk about transportation. There's also, a, of course, you want to look a little more deeply about, about uh, food prep and, and others. And then there's the, as well, the issue of disciplinary processes, which may vary from LEA to LEA. Uh, so those are all uh, aspects that I think, well, I know, certainly I want to know more, more detail about. As far as, as the overall general concept, as I said, I couldn't be more supportive of the fact that we've got to do more for these low performing schools. But I can't help but wonder if, a little bit about the success that that some of them are happy. And maybe the answer is right already on our plate. We just need to do do more of it instead of maybe doing some other things. I'm talking about what DPI is doing now. Uh, maybe uh, if we focus some additional effort that's currently underway in place and has a track record of success, would we not be able to impact more students more quickly? Or no more money. Or maybe yeah, we I, do need to add some money, but, but we need to focus the effort rather than maybe some people are are uh, busy with other things that may not rise to this level of importance. I, I think part of it, again, to reiterate my earlier comments, I mean, part of it is the dynamism that's created <coughs> effectively by doing different things. I mean, that's part of the point of the pilot. I said, you know, being from Charlotte, a lot of us see their bank, Bank of America, or Wells Fargo, or big, huge banks. Let's just say Bank of America is over there. You know, big bank can do a lot of things very well. And, and many of us, 80% of the room could be happy. If 20% of us are, but part of the great part of a small bank, i.e. another pilot program or something else, is it creates um, some dynamism where you have um, them doing something different. And if all of a sudden a, 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 a pilot is doing something Representative Cotham's point, you're replacing the principal more quickly or replacing more of the staff more dramatically. Again, under schools that are that are under our metrics here that are they're already shown to be successful doing it, where they where they come in and make these changes, it forces that kind of reaction. Even the process of, of putting this bill out there has created more interest from superintendents, from districts, on, on a program that we have we've had this legislation in place for a long time. No one is actually exercise on it to Representative Haynes' point. Um, I think if five schools, I mean, I've had a lot of folks say, why aren't we doing more schools? Why aren't we doing 80 schools in this? Or, or like, like some of the other states. Part of my response has been, you know, there's always a struggle in, in, in this, and I wanted to put some tighter guardrails on it and, and start it more slowly, because we are doing some other things, and we want to continue to bounce off of each other, learn from each other, and, and see what's happening when we start a small program like this, what kind of chain reactions does that increase? It may mean that we start doing more of something else that negates the continuing need to do this. Or it may mean, gosh, uh, that this particular tight entity that went in was very successful, so let's do five more of those. Um, I, I don't know the answer, and I don't have any uh, master thoughts in mind about where it goes from. Uh, Representative James. Mr. Chairman, I, I'll be brief. I just wanted to take the opportunity to commend you in particular because I know this is something that you put in a lot of work and time and effort on, and there are others as well. Uh, I just want to say for the record, too, and, and I believe I would, most people would agree with this, you know, there, there are no one-size-fits-all solutions. And, and I know, and I think we all know, that you're not presenting this as that. Uh, 
There are a lot of things that need to be done, but let's be honest, there are no one size fits all schools. There are no one size fits all children. And we can sit here for the rest of the day. There are innumerable reasons why uh, children do not achieve equal. And you know, it is not the role of government to come in and determine what all those are and try to fix them. But there are things that we can do to try to help uh, children and families receive the best education that they can. So with that said, I just want to commend you. I appreciate you for thinking outside the box, if you will, to putting out uh, another solution, recognizing that you're not presenting it as one size fits all. This is not the end all answer. There is no, there is no one end all answer. But um, thank you for your work. I think this has been very, very helpful today. I appreciate the staff and the presenters and what we've heard. And I just look forward to working with you going forward. I appreciate that. Let me, let me just say, where I'm on, let me especially thank the staff, Mr. Karen and, and Kevin, my LA, who've been uh, immensely helpful. I've had to uh, live through lots of questions, lots of drafts. Um, and let me make another sort of follow up again to the broader point. And, and, and frankly, <laughs> some things Representative Haynes said to continue to hit the time with me, which is just um, none of this is, is fast enough uh, for the kid. It's easy for us to say, we'll deal with this next session, right? Um, the next session is two more years that a kid is in the same environment, but they're not being successful. Um, and, and like I say, the way I've done it, I've tried as much as possible to make it collaborative. And, 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 um, and in fact, I'm still looking, um, one of the ideas that I'm still working on is in this year one, the ideal situation is to create a match, is for the superintendent to create a match with the district, where they go to the district and the district's going to say, hey, we'll, we would like for one of our schools to go to this district. Um, we want to do a turnaround of our own, for example. Why don't we get some? Why don't we provide some additional support to them in doing their own turnaround? And we'll do uh, an achievement school in that district as well, providing a uh, match. And, I, and, and one of the things we've been <coughs> trying to figure out is, especially in that year one, if you can create a match where uh, folks are excited about, um, you know, a particular um, opportunity with the LEA, um, trying to provide some benefit to the LEA for being willing to enter into that process um, and so I'll, I'll provide some more feedback before the before the next meeting um, on that um, further comments representative Cobb. Yeah, no, I appreciate that comment. It's something, there's something I was thinking about. Part, part of the difficulty with all these things is, one of the things I've tried to make clear is we're not trying to replicate New Orleans or Tennessee. We're trying to do our own North Carolina thing. It doesn't mean that data's not relevant. One of the things I am definitely going to do is put that particular Vanderbilt study um, on our website so that everybody has access to it. Part of the problem is 
Um, I think the short version of what I don't think Dr. Henry would disagree with the short comment, which is, you know, the results in Tennessee are mixed. We can make comments like not all charters are created equal. You know, I mean, some of the schools are great success, some there's not. And um, and 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 I would be, I'm trying to think about how that might work. We'll certainly have public comment from folks that do not, that are not in agreement with it. And, and let me think about if there's a way I can, you, I mean, I, I, I'm, a lot of the folks that do data studies, they're, they're, they would sort of, generally speaking, not necessarily before or against, they would say, well, this is what the data from our program showed under these specifications. You're using different specifications so we can draw any you know, conclusions from that. But I, I definitely, we're always going to get full just, feedback. And I just follow the full disclosure. I don't know what he's going to say, good or bad. I haven't seen it. I know, so I have no idea. But it's the name has been mentioned several times in the study, so it's just part of well, maybe we should hear about that, not knowing anything. With no further comment, uh, thank you guys for a, a nice long session. We'll get out information to you soon. We're here to learn.